If we travel quite a ways due south of the scrapyard, eventually we stumble upon a ruined town very similar to the minefield. However, this place is not littered with mines. Instead, we find one albino rad scorpion. But as soon as we destroy this rad scorpion, we get attacked from behind by a raider. Hey. Got your back. Uh oh, does this mean we've stumbled upon our raider den? The raider came from a house at the top of the hill, but we can't enter this house. The garage door doesn't work, the front door doesn't work. It's all boarded up. Peering down the hill, we see a few more ruined houses, but these are either complete ruins or also boarded up. However, if we look southeast, we see some movement. Another raider walking around by a caravan, crouching down to sneak on over. Over here. I've got your back. Take him down. Sharon ruins everything by charging forward. And he doesn't really leave much for us to do. Sharon, man, stop doing all my work. The raiders have attempted some sort of clumsy fortification of this house. We see a ruined child's merry-go-round just outside and a bunch of wrecked vehicles, fences, and appliances forming a circle around this house. Inside the trailer, we find some buff out on a table and two ammunition canisters beneath it. There's a platform near to a ruined playground rocket to the southeast. On the table is a stim pack and some water, and beneath the table is one more ammunition box. Unlike the other buildings in this community, this house has a working interior. When ready, we can open the door to the raider shack. And immediately upon entry, of course, Sharon just marches right into the kitchen. Hearing the death of their comrades, more raiders from upstairs charge down. Yeah. Okay, cut the shit. I'm well, that's one way to clear a building. After turning off Enclave Radio, we can loot some Medex on a surgical tray near to the radio. This kitchen is disgusting, big puddles of blood all over the floor. We find a bottle of Buff Out in one of the wooden boxes on top of the southwestern countertop. And on the Raider Boss in the kitchen that Sharon killed, we find the unique item, Stab Happy. Stab Happy is the best combat knife in the entire game. It has a pretty low AP cost, costing only 17 AP per attack, making it an excellent weapon for use in VATS. Players with high agility can use Stab Happy to unload a great deal of damage in one round of VATS. With 10 luck and the ninja perk, a high agility character can land a critical strike with Stab Happy in VATS 100% of the time. It also has a slightly higher chance to cripple limbs. Its base stats are much better than the traditional combat knife, dealing 10 damage compared to the combat knife's 7, bringing its damage per second up to 30 compared to 21. It's also better than the other unique combat knife in the game called Occam's Razor, with a higher critical chance multiplier of 4 compared to 3, and higher critical damage of 15 compared to 13. As a side note, the raider boss in this shack will respawn every 72 hours, and on his or her inventory is another copy of Stab Happy. Taking advantage of this bug or feature, we can get an unlimited number of Stab Happies. In the bathroom, we find some cherry bombs in a toilet, and we see a wooden box cleverly concealing some Psycho. Heading upstairs, we find a full suit of combat armor in a footlocker at the top of the stairs, and we find ourselves in a hallway with three rooms. Heading into the northeastern room, we find a trunk to the left. I would call this an end of dungeon steamer trunk, but the reward inside this trunk is not terribly impressive. Inside the cabinet, we find some 10mm ammunition and a copy of Tales of a Junktown Jerky Vendor on a nightstand near the table, next to a big stash of railway spikes. Heading out of this room and moving on into the next bedroom, we find mattresses and puddles of blood all over the floor. There are two doses of jet next to a bloody human skull on the table, and inside the box on the table, we find some pre-war money and mentats. In the nearby cabinet, we get some ammunition and a hunting rifle, and inside the box on the round, 
round white table, we find some rat away. There's another box on the ground, and cleverly hidden behind a box of Abraxo cleaner are two stim packs. The final room in this shack is the bathroom, but there's really nothing here. Just a big puddle of blood on the ground. With that, we finish exploring the Raider house. We can't explore any of the other houses in this community, but there are two other things to point out. One of the mailboxes is booby-trapped. It startled me, so I didn't even try to disarm it. And all of the telephone poles in this area have an Easter egg. If you get up close to them, we see a placard attached to them that reads TES-04. This is, of course, a reference to The Elder Scrolls number 4, which was Oblivion. I believe these appear on most, if not all, of the telephone poles in Fallout 3. Some have been reported on telephone poles near Big Town, and even in Fallout New Vegas, which reused assets from Fallout 3, we'll find this placard on many of the poles in Freeside. Now, while we were exploring this little raider community, we passed by a ruin to the west, some sort of minor town or maybe commercial park. Heading that way, we see raiders guarding the windows of a nearby ruin. They have fortified themselves well here. We see a ruined car as a basis of one of the walls they've erected around the city, supplemented with a bunch of scrap metal. It looks like this path is blocked off, so we're going to walk around this ruin to see if we can find another path. Walking up some stairs and past a ruined office building, we can turn southwest to sneak through another one, which gives us a great view north. Looking directly, into the raider encampment. We see one raider guard patrolling a walkway. However, this side is blocked off with rubble too. While nosing around looking for an avenue in, we discover that this place is called the Bethesda Ruins. Bethesda is the name of a town in Maryland, and it just so happens to be the location of Bethesda's first corporate headquarters. While sneaking through the ruins, we find a downed antenna tower. Climbing up it, we not only get a great view, but all of the nearby raiders can see us. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we killed most of them wandering around this area, but we're too exposed. We need to get down from here. Back on the ground, we can travel down the road north, where we see that the road turns east into the heart of the ruins. After killing a few of the raiders guarding this entrance, we can creep forward to see more raiders guarding a big ruin to the northeast. But we have to be careful. There was a mine in this grass, and understandably so because this spot gives us the best view for sniping off these raiders. We see one more patrolling the street near to a ruined truck, and he never quite comes out far enough for me to get a good shot. Until finally, there we go. With these raiders dead, we can go into the ruin and climb the steps to the second floor. Peering out, we see a metro station off to the northeast and a door to the southeast. But we don't see any more raiders. Have we cleared them all? Next to the body of one of the snipers, we find two ammunition canisters against the wall, and we can climb up to his sniper's roost to see if we can find any more enemies. But no, it looks like we've got them all. So throwing caution to the wind, we can stand on up and head out. Heading east down the road, we can peer to the north and then here to the south, looks like the coast is clear. We see the entrance to a metro station off to the northeast. And then it looks like there are two other entrances. The sky bridge where we killed that patrolling raider earlier is connecting these two short towers, each of which has its own entrance. So we can choose whichever one we like best. We'll likely explore both of them by the time we're done. Heading on over to the south, we can first explore Bethesda offices west. And as soon as we enter... Hey, I've got one. Holy cow, there were two raiders standing right outside the door. Not sure how I could have ever sneaked into here. We hear the sounds of raiders looking for us, so crouching down, we can wait for them to lose our scent. They're upstairs, so we don't have to worry about them just yet. We'll just be quiet while we loot the corpses and explore this first floor. After looting all of the corpses, I headed back to the door just to give us a point of reference from which to explore. That way we understand exactly where we've been. Heading southeast first, we can knock off a damaged garden gnome from a pedestal.
pistol, but there's nothing under the box, and then head through a doorway to the east. Here we just find a first aid kit inside a gun cabinet. Heading back out, we see another door just to the left, leading to a bathroom. Here we find an ammunition canister inside a cabinet, and some cherry bombs in a toilet. Directly in front of this bathroom is what must have been a receptionist's desk. We find a first aid box on the ground behind the desk, and a big book of science lying on the counter next to a terminal. The terminal is just a turret control system, and we destroyed the turret, so there's no point in accessing this terminal. Continuing to the opposite side of the room, we can loot a variety of cabinets and desks. There's a bed over here, but not much else. Until continuing south, we go through a broken wall to find a doorway to the south, leading to a filled-in staircase. Just outside this staircase is a raider bed. The footlocker at the foot of the bed is empty, but beneath the bed we do find an easy locked ammunition box. Above the bed is a wall-mounted shelf with some railway spikes and two bottles of dirty water with a frag grenade hidden beneath two bottles of wonder glue. We can then go east through a broken wall into this next room, there is a doorway leading to the southeast, but that looks like the way up and out, so instead we'll explore the final room through a doorway to the east. This at one time led to another staircase, which is now filled in with rubble. The only thing of note in this room is if we look in one of the boxes, we find a stealth boy. With the bottom floor explored, we can continue forward, but it's here that we notice a huge hole in the ceiling, and dangling above the hole are two fragmentation grenade bouquets. But where's the tripwire? Where's the trigger? We haven't seen anything of the sword chest yet. Turning off our Pip-Boy light and creeping up the stairs, we see a hallway to a staircase to the left, and then a door to the right. Tiptoeing by as quietly as possible. Where? Oh, that one was nasty. His legs continued to kick for some time afterwards. After looting the filing cabinets to the northeast, we can turn west where we find two blood packs and a stim pack on the table. And on a filing cabinet to the southwest, we find two pre-war books. That's 200 caps from Scribe Yearling. That's it for this room, so heading out we can turn off our Pip-Boy light, take out our Gauss rifle, and creep up the stairs. At the top, we see a room to the west, a caved-in staircase to the southwest, and a door leading outside to the northeast. Heading into the western room first, we find the raider boss holding his flamer asleep on the bed. This room is booby-trapped. We see a pressure plate on the ground connected to three combat shotguns. I wanted to see what would happen if we trigger the plate. Not a whole lot. So instead, reloading a previous save, we can disarm these. In the middle of the floor is a teddy bear, hanging from a hook skewered through his head. He dangles right above a huge hole in the floor, where we find those two fragmentation grenade bouquets we saw earlier. What kind of trap is this? How exactly did raiders expect to trap people here? Do they think that scavers just reach for every teddy bear they find? Well, I wanted to enjoy this trap as it was designed, so jumping up to the teddy bear, we can fall through. Wait for it. Ooh, man, that's nasty. Ow! Reloading a previous save, we can instead simply reach up and take the bear. He's easy to reach, we don't even have to jump for him. But now, how to disarm these grenade bouquets? Well, I see two possible ways to do this. There's a filing cabinet in the southeastern corner that looks like I might be able to jump atop it, and then another one in the northwestern corner. Trying the northwestern one first. Nope, I fell right through. I tried again, but that didn't work. So for the third try, I jumped to the southwest and landed on top of the filing cabinet. From here, we can turn around, crouch down to disarm both of the grenade bouquets. Then it's just a matter of dropping down to the floor and continuing to explore. Back up the stairs and back into the room, we see a grisly scene in a cooler, a hacked up and completely dismembered Wastelander corpse. Why did they have this body on ice? Is this evidence that these raiders were cannibals? On a shelf to the southeast are more railway spikes and another stealth boy. There's a stack of four boxes on the western side of this cabinet, and after inspecting each of them, we find a mini nuke hidden in the very last one. And this is why we explore every single box. 
continuing to the southwest after turning off the radio, we can move a steam gauge assembly from atop a box, loot a Mentats on the counter, and then tilt open the box to find a copy of Dean's Electronics inside. To the southeast, we find one bottle of Radex on a desk, and that's it for this top floor. So to continue forward, we need to leave by going out the eastern door to the Capital Wasteland. This brings us outside, on top of the Sky Bridge where we killed that patrolling raider at the very beginning. Looking south, we see the scrap barricade we couldn't get through earlier, and looking north, we just see a bunch of ruined cars. No enemies, so I think I'm safe. Of course, the moment I stand up is the moment this guy leaves the truck. Oh well, I'll loot his body later. There are two ammo boxes beneath a table here, and that's it for the Sky Bridge. We can continue east to explore Bethesda offices east. We arrive in a darkened, smoky room. Heading through the eastern door, we see light to the north, and we see red dots on our compass. Looks like rubble has fallen from upstairs to block the northern passage. This forces us south, bringing us to a hallway blocked off to the west, but with a big barrel fire to the east. On top of a fridge near the fire, we find some medics and a box out, and then peering around a door to the northeast. After killing the raider with the flamer, we can get rid of a ceiling mounted turret. Heading into the room, we see another raider through an adjacent doorway. On the raider boss's body is a finger if we have the Lawbringer perk, and a safe key, as well as a copy of US Army 30 handy flamethrower recipes. But our light catches the attention of yet another wandering raider. Sometimes you just run out of patience and you gotta pull out the big guns. To the southeast corner near this raider boss's body is a workbench, on top of which we find a bottle cap mine and a toolbox. Moving northwest, we can loot some filing cabinets and we see a body that we are not responsible for. This is the body of a mercenary. There's nothing on his corpse. Looks like he was just some raider prey. We find a bathtub filled with water, or maybe they were trying to distill some bathtub moonshine. And we were just getting into looting some locked containers on top of a bunk bed when another raider comes from behind. What was she doing staring at the wall on the other side of the hall? I don't know, these raiders, man, I tell ya. Heading back to the bunk bed, we can loot a grenade box and an ammunition box, and then turn south where we find a desk, and on the desk, next to a human skull, is the lockpick bobblehead. You found a vault -Tec limited edition bobblehead. The inscription on the base reads, Always strive for the unobtainable. Your lockpick skill has been permanently increased by 10. On the nearby desk is another turret control terminal, and we can use the key we found on the raider boss's body to open the wall-mounted safe above this desk. Inside, we find some caps, ammo, and a stealth boy. Heading out into the hallway and turning left, we can pass through a western doorway to more office cubicles. In one, we find a copy of Chinese Army Special Ops Training Manual right next to two missiles. To continue, we can creep through a broken wall to the west. Here we find a raider meal set out on a cabinet with some darts nearby. There are sugar bombs on a nearby desk, which we can use to get some ultra jet, and then a first aid box on a box to the northwest. After looting this top room, we can go down a rubble ramp to the bottom floor and through a big hole in the wall. But it looks like all of the enemies down here had run up to attack us upstairs. The place is clear. Turning east, we find a bathroom. Inside a cabinet in the bathroom is a first aid kit. There are two human skulls on the toilet in typical raider fashion. Heading into a broken office cubicle, we can loot some mentats on a desk. And with that, we finish exploring this tower. We can now open the door back out to the capital wasteland. Back outside, we can loot the body of the raider who came out of the truck earlier and then climb a ramp into the back of his truck. Here we find two ammo containers and a first aid box. All that remains of this corporate office park is to explore the nearby metro station. Unlike other metro stations, we don't find one of those big map signs posted outside. We can head down the stairs to the gate where we learn that this station is called the Bethesda Underworks. 
as soon as we enter, we get rushed by ghouls. Now, this is a scripted event. The first time we enter this Underworks, the game is scripted to send wave after wave of ghouls at us. This does have an interesting side effect. If we're stealth, using a stealth boy or a Chinese stealth suit, the ghouls don't see us and so they run right out of the metro station. If the raiders are still alive, they run right into the camp of the raiders. We can then witness a huge battle between feral ghouls and raiders. And if the feral ghouls die out there in the Bethesda ruins, then every three days they'll respawn along with all of the other raiders, again initiating a huge firefight. But in my case, I just killed them here at the entrance. On the wall, we see a wonderful pre-war poster. DC's fastest highway is underground. See a ticket agent today for our special monthly ticket and save. Ride the tunnel today and avoid the city's growing pollution and congestion. Our extensive lines will get you anywhere you want to go with half the holdup. Just on the other side of the turnstiles is an Etotronic, but nothing interesting inside unless you like cigarettes and Salisbury steak. We can loot a teddy bear on the ground for little Marie and then head down into the station proper. On the wall is a big sign for GNR. Tune in now to Galaxy News Radio in Washington, D.C. 103.8 on your radio FM dial. Weather, sports, news, and traffic. I wonder if 3Dog broadcasts on 103.8 today. In a box right next to this sign are two bottles of Radix. And on a bench near to a baby carriage, we find a stew pot on top of which lies a copy of Tales of a Junktown Jerky Vendor. We walk away from this exploration with two of these books. On the ceiling, we see something strange and unique. A whole bunch of irradiated barrels, glowing green, are peeking out from the ceiling. This is very strange. How can we explain this? I suppose there are any number of ways we could explain this. Maybe the government or some corporation had used a basement of a nearby building to store their toxic waste. But if we look just south of the Bethesda ruins, we find the back end of a dump truck on the side of the road overlooking a nearby river. This dump truck is filled with toxic irradiated barrels, and the barrels are spilling down the hillside to the river below. Now, we don't see a whole lot of barrels in the river right now, nor do we see a big hole where the barrels have fallen down to the metro tunnels below, but it is clear that these barrels have been here for over 200 years, and that local authorities authorities or corporations had used this riverbed as a toxic dumping grounds right outside this corporate park. My bet is that this river had been used for dumping toxic waste for so long that the barrels began to leak and eat their way through the ground into the metro tunnels below. Unlike many metro stations, there is no connecting station on the other side of this platform, so our only option is to go down. Going down the southeastern escalator first, we see a big buckling train on the tracks. There is nothing to the southeast. This is just a dead end. Hiding underneath a scorched, ruined book in a box under the escalator is one rat away. And then we hear a glowing one. Looks like we didn't get them all. He's probably gonna run at me from the other side of this train. Where is he? Where'd he go? Ow! He climbed the escalator on the other side and went across the platform, okay. We can cross the tracks using these planks. If we look down the tracks to the north, we see it completely blocked off. And the same is true for the western tunnel. It's completely blocked to the north. Turning south, we see where this glowing one must have come from. There's a big stack of glowing irradiated barrels on the ground directly beneath the hole in the ceiling from which they must have fallen. Heading north behind the escalator, we come to a dead end. No doors, no loot, no tunnels leading that way, which means the only path forward is to go down the tracks to the south. Here we find an opening in the wall to the west, which leads us to some utility tunnels. We find a skeleton leaning against a wall next to a big stew pot filled with stim packs and one Radaway. He freaks out if we loot the stim packs and Radaway, but he's dead now, can't do much about it. Heading west, we find ourselves in a split, but looking closely, this looks like a big loop. Heading west, 
Yeah, sure enough, that path is a big loop leading back here, but oh, we've got a storage closet here. And it's already opened. Inside we find a skeleton, possibly the skeleton of the man who opened it. There's a first aid box on the wall, an ammunition box on top of two other boxes. The very bottom, we have to turn over this wooden box to reveal another cleverly hidden mini nuke. So pro tip to all of you big guns characters out there, look under every box for your mini nukes. After looting a frag grenade, we can find a copy of Grognak the Barbarian on the second shelf, a nuke cola quantum on the bottom, three more frag grenades on the second shelf, and then an average locked ammo box on the ground. With that, we can head out of the utility closet and continue down the tunnel to the south. This leads us to another big room filled with toxic waste barrels, which again are falling into this room from the ceiling. The only way I can explain this is that this point must be directly beneath that big pile of toxic barrels we found on the floor inside the metro station. The toxic chemicals in these barrels must be so corrosive and so radioactive that over 200 years they have eaten their way through steel and concrete all the way to this tunnel. Inside a box to the west we find one Mentats, and that's all the loot we find in the Bethesda Underworks. To leave, we can climb up a big ladder lit with sunlight to the west. This brings us out into the middle of the street, right outside the Bethesda ruins. And with that, we finish exploring the ruins in Fallout 3 that bears its publisher's name. Did you find the Bethesda ruins and the Bethesda underworks in your gameplay? How did you explain the toxic barrels that appear to be melting through the earth into this metro tunnel? Did you walk away with the lockpicking bobblehead? And did you find Stab Happy, the unique combat knife in the nearby Raider house? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook to keep up to date with all Oxhorn news. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.